Thanks, Steve. Uh, Pastor Steve, thanks, uh, Sarah, uh, for those wonderful songs this morning. And uh, good morning to everyone, and it's good to be with you again uh, in these crazy times in which we live uh, as we await the return of the Lord and as we try to be faithful to Him uh, in the meantime. I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're sitting there uh, in your group or you're by yourself, uh, hopefully you've got a copy of the Scriptures, and uh, maybe if uh, you don't do it online, if you have a copy of the notes, and those notes are available, you want to get out to the website, ebczenia.org. Uh, or if uh, you got an email from Barb, you're going to find those notes and you want to pull those out. You want to have something to write with. Uh, uh, I'm sure everything that I say, you're not going to remember, but I'm sure that it, with the Word of God and the way He works with His Word, He has things to say to us uh, and He has something to say to you this morning. And so be prepared to write it down. Uh, be prepared to put it down. And also, uh, if you're in a care group, uh, this will provide some opportunities for you to have a little bit better of a discussion uh, as you come with some of your thoughts that you've written down as we get underway. So today, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, as we were last week. This is part 2 uh, of a two-part message on uh, God's advice for us, giving us some clarity uh, in the midst of this kind of crisis about what He has intended for us uh, in terms of relationships within the body of Christ. So uh, you can turn to Ephesians 2, and we'll come just a little bit later, and we'll read that passage together. So as we mentioned last week in part one of this two-sermon series, the societal turmoil surrounding the tragic killing of George Floyd, to mention only the most prominent example of a series of recent tragic events, is rippling through the church. It is simply overwhelming and discouraging some Christ followers. I don't know how many I've talked to, it just says they want to turn off the TV and close the doors and uh, go for a walk outside, while on the other hand, it's turning others into combatants, fighting each other over how Christ followers should respond. The impact of these events on the church has the fingerprints of the evil one all over it. And again, in the book of Ephesians, is famous for uh, Paul culminating by reminding us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 that the battle that we fight is against the evil one. Uh, he is at work uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, trying to encourage us to give rein to the evil desires that uh, are in each of our hearts uh, and create an alternative kingdom over against God's kingdom. But this crisis has his fingerprints all over him. At times of crisis, the evil one is constantly trying to convince God's people of two things. Now, at least maybe other things, but at least two. One, that God is not in control because he's either inept, he's not wise, or he's weak, he's impotent to help. And therefore, two, that his ultimate triumph is in jeopardy. So to be faithful to him doesn't make sense. This means that it makes no sense to look to God for help in the moment or to be faithful to him when the house is burning down. He can offer you no real help in the crisis right now, and there is certainly no sense holding on to some hope that it will all make sense in the future when God writes everything. So we need, sometimes people respond to that and say, well, we need to help him out or maybe just abandon his way altogether. Why not look to some other group or movement for salvation? Why not trust the loudest, boldest, angriest voices that have the endorsement of our culture's celebrities? Why don't we pay attention to the actresses and actors? Why not listen to the athletes, maybe the key politicians or the social media influences or TV and radio commentators or grievance or advocacy groups or the person that we think is most in touch with the culture who's a religious authority? Why not see the cultural path of least resistance as the right path? Or, if you remember your Bible history, you remember when Sarah uh, came up to the fact that her body had passed its time to be able to deliver a child and have not deliver a child, but yet God had promised through her a child was going to come. She felt that God had just dropped the ball or his plan wasn't going to work, and so she was going to help out God. Uh, so she brings Hagar into the picture uh, and actually manifests her lack of faith in God, complicates the picture, makes a mess, uh, and doubts God's power and his wisdom. And so some people today think, well, maybe God needs some help, so maybe we just need to adjust God's plan a bit so we can help him out. Or, some even worse, maybe we need to abandon God and his prescription and accept and follow some other group or movement's path to peace and flourishing. For those who think this way, it seems that the church 
as it has been just doesn't work. It's out of touch. It needs to catch up to culture as if the Holy Spirit is moving wherever the culture is moving. No need to worry here about any other spirits at work. The evil one wants to undermine the mission of the people of God by turning his people away from him in frustration, like, God, where are you? What are you doing? Or in embarrassment, right, to hold on to what God says seems embarrassing, or to turn against each other. But as we were reminded last week, when the church came into existence, the Apostle Paul had to deal with class and race-based division and hostility that was a prominent feature of Roman culture. These divisions came through the doors of the church as people came to Christ and as they struggled to live and grow and serve uh, together as the people of God. The powerful versus the powerless, the rich versus the poor, the Jew versus the Gentile. And with Jews and Gentiles, the ancient hostilities were hard to overcome. So Jews struggled within themselves. They had factions of Jews fighting Jews, right? Jews that were more Hellenized and Jews that that felt that they'd been more culturally faithful were fighting one another as new believers in Christ and Gentile groups were fighting Gentile groups. And then Jews were fighting Gentiles generally. And these tensions constantly threatened the life, unity, and mission of the church. So Paul's prescription, right, was to teach them what God had done in making them his people and what resources they had to live that out. Paul didn't turn to the Roman government or to some advocacy group or some movement. He turned to the resources that God had given them in Christ. He was confident that God's work in Christ by the Spirit could enable them not only to stay together, but to increasingly know the kind of unity God had made possible in the work of Christ. The church is not only made up of God's people, but it is an institution that is absolutely necessary for the people of God and for God's mission in the world. So Paul emphasized the importance of the church for their personal growth, for their protection, for their witness to the world. He didn't get discouraged by the struggle. He knew, and this is an important thing for us to realize right now, he knew that the struggle with sin of all sorts would continue until the king returned to complete what he had begun on the cross and from the empty tomb. And he didn't give in to it and let the divisions happen. He fought for a Christ-centered unity among God's racially and socially economically diverse people. Now more than ever in this moment of turmoil and crisis, we who believe in God's good greatness and confidently expect his ultimate triumph through Christ need to return together to God's word on our knees to remind ourselves and each other that God's plan is not only to redeem individuals, to buy us back from slavery to sin, but to bring them together into his new people, his family. We need to be reminded of who God is, who we are as his people, and what he is up to in and through us. And because of whose we are and what that means... We need to be reminded of the resources we have to live out this new life and what this new life and this new family means for how we think of and act toward each other. We need to be on guard against looking to any other group to set the marching orders for what we should say or do. So let's look at Paul's prescription in Ephesians chapter 2, and let's come here and read this passage together. So if you have your Bibles, or whether it's electronic or paper, whatever you have, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're coming to verse 11. We want to read from here uh, down to the end of chapter 2. Therefore, remember that formerly uh, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both 
of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, in Christ, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, what we find in our passage here is that all of this, the possibility of verses 11 to 22, all of this is a possibility because back in chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, is that God took dead people who were spiritually dead, who were dead in their sins, and he made them alive in Christ, which enables them, right, spiritually enables them for a life deeply connected to the community of God's people. So it's very clear in 2, 1 to 7, as he follows on in verses 11 and following, is that God just doesn't rescue individuals so that they can enjoy the benefits and live out that life as an individual detached from God's people. No, he wants to carry it on and say God just isn't riding us with him on this vertical axis, but he's riding us with each other on the horizontal axis. So, but two things here, not only does this bring people that are dead alive, right, rescue them from their slavery to sin, take them out of the kingdom of darkness and put them into the kingdom of light, but at the same time, it disposes them and reorders them so that they want to and they do move toward each other, right? So one of the effects of coming to life in Christ is that it changes the way you approach your neighbor, the way you look at the people in the body of Christ. And that's why Paul is taking that straightforwardly. If you're changed, if you're a follower of Christ, then this type of community that he's going to lay out is what God has, has fitted you for and will call you toward, right? And the Spirit is moving you toward that, right? So they're intricately linked. You can't say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm right with the Lord, but I don't care about his people, Right? I'm just going to sit here, and uh, if you're at home today and you're saying, you know, it's just great, I can just listen to whoever I want to. Matter of fact, I don't know why I'm listening to Greg this morning. I could pick somebody better, but I, I'm just listening to whoever I want to this morning, and I don't need the rest of the people in here. Matter of fact, they don't have any distractions. I don't have to worry about other people's problems and so forth and so on. Well, I want to tell you right now that that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God should be working in you to move you toward other people, out of love for them, out of your sense of need for them, because God has wired you. If you have been changed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you will want to love your neighbor. So he's enabled that. So the believer is now a part of the people of God who have been put into an intimate connection with Christ by the work of the Spirit according to the Father's will. This is all God's plan. They join in together to know and experience the type of oneness known within God himself, right? And if you don't believe this, read John chapter 17 and read Jesus' prayer. We may even get there at the end of our sermon of what he prays for, that we might be one as his people in the same way that he and the Father are one. In fact, earlier in this letter, Paul makes it clear is that the fullness of God's program, of the fullness of what he's trying to demonstrate in terms of of, of giving a picture of what ultimately will happen when everything is righted, is the fullest picture of what God's up to should be the church, right? Matter of fact, look back with me at Ephesians chapter 1 at the end of his prayer, uh, this first prayer, and when he talks about the, the effect of Christ's uh, victory, and he talks about the fact that we need to know about our God, that we're his prized possession, that our hope is secure, and that Christ has conquered all the evil forces that had oppressed us and influenced us, and we sit in the heavenlies alongside of him. And then in verse 22, and God placed all things under his feet, Christ's feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the church, right? Christ the head, we're his body, we're connected to him intimately. His, his body, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So <clears throat> Paul makes it clear that the fullness of what God is up to in the world is most completely demonstrated in the life of the people of God together. There is a dimension of our witness to the world that can't happen as an individual Christian. Right? 
So this is why Jesus prays in John 17, how will people know that you're my followers? It's by the way you love each other. Well, apart from having people to love, you can't demonstrate that quality, and that's the unique quality. One of the unique qualities that marks the people of God is that when you look at this group of people who's socioeconomically diverse, racially different, ethnically different, right, different tastes and backgrounds, males and females, rich and poor, that they all love each other and they love God and they treat each other with dignity and respect, that's something that God has to do because that's not indicative of the human world apart from him. So this church is the place where God's writing of things in themselves and in relationship to each other is most powerfully on display. This is why Paul's going to say in our passage is that when you see the church, right, it's just happening in part because we're waiting for the fullness of it when Christ returns, but you should see humanity being restored. Women being women, men being men, people in relationships with each other that God intended because he's recreating, he's making a new humanity. So Paul begins his exhortation later on in Ephesians 4.1, and it's not surprising if this is God's intent. <clears throat> the very first thing he says in 4.1 is that we as the people of God have been united, and one of our major, major missions is not to let that unity be broken. He says, spare no effort to maintain the unity which the Spirit has produced. And then he goes on to say that everything that's marked by God is marked by unity and harmness and people committed to one another for their mutual flourishing, right? That's peace, right? Because there's one God and one Lord and one faith and one baptism. Just you have one hope and one calling, right? If you don't get the idea of oneness, you're missing something. So, as we talked about last week, Paul began in verses 11 through 13 by looking back at what used to be the case between Jews and Gentiles. That is no longer true for those who believe in Christ, right? So this should promote praise that Christ has overcome these hostilities that are a part of our fallenness, right? Where we want our way, we want to be God, right? We want to have other people serve us. We want to have other people to be used by us and to kowtow to us and exalt us, right? The vainglory that Paul talks about. That's who we were apart. As Paul would say in Titus chapter 3, we hated other people, and we were hated, okay, a life of hate. But this should promote praise because God has done something to change that, but it also is a picture, right, of what shouldn't be true of us now. It's a picture of what shouldn't be true of us now. So what was this past reality? And you'll see on your notes, this past reality was a life of enmity, of hostility, that's a a term you often see in many translations, enmity is is hatred directed toward another person, and it's a life of emptiness, enmity and emptiness. Gentiles, apart from believing in Christ and non-believing Jews as well, were enemies to Jews and Jews to them. And apart from Christ, their lives were empty of any resources from God to fix themselves. This is the, 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 the fallacy of thinking that there's some political group, there's some advocacy group, there's some particular group of people that can right these deep, dark divisions that are caused by sin between people. So Christ is the only one who's done it, and it needs a transformation from the inside out. So this enmity and emptiness was paced out. There was no peace. Life was filled with ancient hostilities, right? In today, in this moment, it's not... It's not uh, surprising to see somebody, two two people of different color who have a disagreement with each other, uh, and then uh, they're brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're, they're, they're haggling over something or disagreeing over something, and then somebody goes right back to the bottom and said, this is all about your ancient hostility that's still at play against me because I'm a black woman or a white man. And Christ says, those have been killed. That's the way you used to be. So there was no saving king. They had no access to the Messiah, right, to deliver them from their sins. There's no people. They were separated from God's people. They were separated from belonging to God's people. They had no lasting possessions. They were foreigners to the covenants embodying the promise, right? So they had nothing to look forward to in terms of an inheritance, right, that would last forever, all right? primarily of being with the Lord and knowing his blessing and being free from the consequences of the fall. And they had no bright future because they stood under God's judgment and they had no, and this is the key thing that underlies all the rest of them, they had no forgiving, welcoming God. They had no relationship with God. 
their idols, which really is ultimately ourselves when we don't uh, submit to God. All other things that we submit to are just elaborate forms of self-worship because they are no gods. They're the things that we create and we dictate to them uh, their powers and and what we have to do in response uh, as our responsibility to them. And so we either worship God or ourselves, either directly or indirectly, and they offer no salvation, no hope, no lasting possessions, and no people. So that's where we used to be. And he says in verse 13, here was God's answer. In chapter 2 and verse 13, if you look at this one again here, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, right, from God and from his people have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, our passage then is going to talk about, well, what did Christ do to make this happen? So if you're looking at your notes here, you're going to find that this next passage here, down from 14 and following, is going to answer a whole series of questions. Well, what did Christ do? And then why did he do it? How do we know that he did this, right? How do we know that when we're looking back at this event, how do we know that this was what he was doing, right? Because this is asking a lot, right, today in our poisoned environment to tell people who are brothers and sisters in Christ of all colors and socioeconomic levels that it's God has acted in Christ to enable us and to call us to be one people and to not let those things divide us, right? It's asking a lot of people. Why can't we just stay in our groups? Why can't I just pick a group of Christians that I'm comfortable with? Why do I have to be concerned about the fact that, that uh, African American or black people don't feel comfortable around me or my church? Why do I have to feel that I have to justify myself before this group of people all the time? Why do I need to wrestle with the fact that these people don't have my tastes and they don't like the things I like? And matter of fact, that I want to hang around with people who like to hang around Starbucks and they don't care about Starbucks. Why do I even have to worry about that? Why do I even need to let that be a tension in my life? Well, here, God wants to say that his blessing, his purposes, his protection, his glory is on the other side of us pushing toward each other with patience and hope and perseverance. Because God did it. Well, how do we know? Well, we're going to find out. How do we know that God wants that? He's asking a lot. And what did he make possible? What kind of unity is it? What kind of people is it? Right? Anybody who has a dysfunctional family, right? Uh, you can say, well, we, you know, I love my family. We get together once a year for a reunion. Right? Uh, we get together for a reunion. We're just at least in the same place. Now, I can't stand half the people are there, but at least I show up. Right? Well, that's not the kind of unity that he's talking about. And it's not a unity uh, around some particular cause. It's a unity around Jesus, for him, like him, right? So it's not a unity around a secular cause or a political party. It's a unity around him, right? And it's not a one-note unity. It's a unity that penetrates across all the dimensions of human interactions, It doesn't reduce any one problem to the, it doesn't reduce the struggle to any one difficult problem. There are many of them. So let's look at that. Well, first, what I want you to notice as you look at this passage is that it's very clear, uh, before we even answer those questions, is that Christ is the center of everything, right? Christ is the center. And this is what, it sounds like a cliche, but it's the truth biblically that Christ, his coming in God's plan by uh, and providing for by the enabling of the Spirit, it is Christ's work as the only thing that can overcome the hatred that exists between human beings. Because the hatred that exists between human beings is an after effect and an outgrowth of their being distanced from and alienated from the God that they were created for. And their rebellious hearts and rejection of him turns them away from the one who can enable them not only to understand themselves and be righted to themselves, but to be righted to each other. And so Christ had to come fundamentally to deal with our rebellion against God, and only Christ could do that. We're going to talk about how he could do that. But he had to deal with that because my hatred of someone of a different color, my hatred of someone of a different socioeconomic level, my willingness to put stereotypes on people and not treat them as individuals so that I can dismiss them and put them in categories. Well, all that is a part of who I am, and it's baked into me. And unless God does something deeply transformative, I won't change. 
No external effect can make that. Laws can mitigate the effects of that hatred. They can suppress it. They can push it underground. But they can't make me positively love that other person. To call them genuinely a brother and sister. So Christ is at the center of it all. And I want you to notice here that it says something radical here. Christ is our peace. Okay, now there's a figure of speech here to say that he is our peace. It's to talk about Christ, the one who affects everything that's necessary for us to be at peace with God and at peace with one another, is put for what he affects. Okay? And peace in this context is not the cessation of or the stopping of hostilities. Right? So like peace is like you have the warring parties, in many people's mind, you have the two warring parties, and then they just all put down their arms and then they walk back and go to their own countries and stop attacking each other. Right? That's not peace biblically. Peace is you put down the arms and you walk across the lines and you call each other brother and sister in Christ. And now, instead of attacking each other to try to destroy each other, you're living a life that's trying to bring about God's best for each other. You're moving toward each other to try to say, God, how can you use me today for my brother, for my sister, to grow them today? How can I be an instrument in your hands for them to get a hold of your richest blessings. Help them to be faithful to you, to love you. God, how can I protect them? How can I live for them? How can I, God, let me give up the best for myself so that they can have your best. Because that's what Jesus did. That's the kind of peace. So peace for Paul is this holistic flourishing that is not only the the stopping of hostilities, but it's a complete change, right? If you go to uh, court and you stand before a judge, Uh, In any court in the land, he represents the law. And and if you get acquitted, right, of your crime, and the the judge figures out and says, well, you're acquitted. Well, he doesn't get up from the bench and walk around. And if if you've seen that, that impressive bench, and he comes down on the floor, and he grabs you in a big bear hug, and then he grabs the person that maybe was charging you and things like that. It's okay, everybody come together, group hug. Group hug, now we're all friends. No, No, it's just next, right? So the case has been settled, you don't have the hostility that can be directed toward you because it's been, it's been put down by the law, but it doesn't mean that the people who were formerly enemies now are brothers and sisters. Well, this is the kind of peace that Christ affects. And so he's there. And so other terms are there. Reconciliation, bringing the two into a relationship of peace where things have been taken care of that stand between them. Making the two one, verse 14, right? Creating one new humanity, verse 15. Gaining access by one spirit, right? So Christ, right, is the one who's absolutely essential to bring about this deep transformation that needs to happen in each one of us. Okay, now, let's, let's probe these a little bit. What did he do, verses 14 and 15? Christ, and if you're looking at the phrase here, Christ removed the barrier to peace. Christ removed the barrier, right? There's a barrier, That sin raises up between people, and Christ removed it, right? And the barrier to peace is he removed the barrier barrier to harmony, to a a mutual commitment to each other's flourishing. That's what he removed, that barrier that kept you from being uh, in a harmonious relationship with that person, that brother or sister. And someone, he removed the barrier in your heart that made you not want to use them or to dominate them or to dismiss them, but that now you're disposed to try to bring about God's best for them. That's what Christ brought about. So here you see it here. For he himself is our peace. He made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. So here's what happened here. Christ removed the barrier between God and rebels caused by their law-breaking. They broke God's righteous standards because that was who they were. And that barrier set God over against them rightly, justly, for their neglect and transgression of his standards. He did this, Christ did this, so that rebels could be brought into a life-giving relationship with God and each other. Somebody had to take the just penalty for our sin to enable us to be in a right relationship with God so that we could be restored to our senses, so that we could be transformed, so that we could know the blessing of his forgiveness and his transforming power. 
So Christ made it possible for them to be God's people together by dying on the cross. He removed the barrier that the law made between them and God because they were incapable of keeping its just demands. Right? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. They were dead to God by nature and by choice. And he removed the barrier that the law became between Jews and Gentiles. The law no longer governs God's people directly. We no longer live under the law directly. We live under the teaching of the apostles, and we live under the law to the degree that it's taken up in and utilized by the apostolic teaching because we're new covenant people. And the law is no longer capable of being used sinfully by Jews to elevate themselves and exclude Gentiles. So if you want to read about that, you can read Romans chapter 2, right? So it was used as a barrier, both in the sense that we were over against God because of our law-breaking, and it was a barrier also sociologically because it was used to suggest that the Gentiles were unworthy of God's grace and excluded from his blessings. So the problem wasn't with the law, it was with the inability of those trying to keep it. In his death, Jesus removed the barrier that the law posed to our relationship with God. His sinless life allowed him to be our substitute. And his divinity made him capable of bearing the sins of humanity. And when we believe on him by God's grace, 2 verses 8 and 9, we are united to him so that his righteous life is put on our account. We are acquitted from our law-breaking before God, and we are welcomed into God's presence as we stand in God's right, Christ's righteousness. He removed the barrier to us being transformed and brought to our senses and being brought together as a new humanity, okay? Uh, Verses 15 and 16. Why did he do it? Christ did this explicitly to create his one new people. Look at 15b and 16. So why did he do this? Um, His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both uh, of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Right. So here, what the issue is, it's his intent is to create this new people. This wasn't an afterthought. This wasn't something that the people themselves figured out among themselves. Oh, we're all brothers and sisters. I guess we should hang together. No, Christ in his work has done something and is working by the Spirit to move us toward one another. So God, what he does is he reclaims and restores his people so that his original creation plan is brought to fruition in them. This is why he can call them a new humanity. They are his new creation, righted with each other because they are righted with him. That's a key thing. You can't be righted with another person without being righted with God. I'm talking about deeply, richly. uh, This third race has often been called, came about through Christ as both Jew and Gentile trust in Christ. They're united to him and so united to each other. The real union they have with Christ unites them truly and forever to each other. This is what Christ intended. Okay, now, number four. How do we know that this was what Christ did? How do we know that this is what Christ was doing right on the cross? Well, Well, what he wants to make clear is that Christ said that's what he was doing. And he's reinforced that message through the message of his authorized representatives, the apostles. Okay? This is why later on we're going to find out that the church is built on the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Jesus himself. So here's what he says. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Right? So not only did Christ say, I came that you might have peace right, with God and with one another. If you want to read about Jesus talking about peace and what he meant, Read what's called the Upper Room Discourse. It's a good one for you. Go through. It's John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. It says, I give you my peace, John 14. Right? He came to bring peace, and he culminates that Upper Room Discourse with a prayer that they might enter into the harmonious, mutually beneficial relationship that he knows with the Father, that they might appropriate his resources to be that kind of people toward each other. So Jesus taught it, and his apostles uh, reinforced it. And then finally, what did he make possible? And this comes down to verse 19. Consequently, 
This is the result. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So what what does he want to make possible? This group of mutually loving one another, people, who are pictured now as building blocks in this temple that they themselves, not only do they know God's transforming work in them individually, but when they come together as God's people and they obey him and they move toward one another uh, with God's priorities for each other, with his passions for each other, then there's a sense of the presence of God that marks their gatherings together and their relationships with one another that is an add-on, an extra deeper, richer dimension of what it means to be the people of God. Because God just didn't want to restore my relationship with him. He wanted to restore my relationship with my neighbor and make me different. So we come together in this temple. What's the foundation? What guides us? Not politics, not some other interest group, but what the apostolic teaching. And what's the apostolic teaching? It's rooted in Christ and what he said and did. And then what does it make us? a group of people that come together that are intimately connected with one another and mutually loving one another to grow ourselves up in such a way that we benefit from all the resources that God has given us in Christ so that we can enjoy him and represent him in the world. That's the vision. So now those who were formerly far off from God, from each other, have been brought near. Now, the time I have left... Let me give you five implications for our moment. Clarity in the moment of this crisis that come from this passage. Okay, one. Okay, it's going to, they're going to be wordy, but you've got things to write and you've got some blanks to fill in, so do this here. And I want to, I'm saying this deliberately because we need to be reminded this book begins with a praise, a psalm of praise. Because when Paul is calling them to something that is so radically different, that seems absolutely impossible. How on earth can the ancient hostilities between Jews and Gentiles be overcome? How can the the hated and being hated, how can that be overcome between groups of Gentiles, between groups of Jews against each other? God, that, that, Paul, that is insurmountable. That's impossible. That's, it's unbelievable for you to even ask that. Why don't you just let the Jews have their churches, Gentiles have their churches, and let us all divide up in the easiest groups. At least we won't be struggling with all these issues. Paul says, no, you don't, if you think that way, number one, you don't get God's plan and you don't get God's greatness. God is a big God who's working all things out and it's his purpose that he's empowered you with the very power that enabled Christ to conquer everything that threatens you. It's his purpose for you to all be righted in respect to yourself, righted in respect to each other and submitting to Christ under him as one people. So the first one. The first one, the all good, all wise, all powerful father has made a way to replace hatred between individuals and people groups with love. God has made a way to replace hatred between individuals and groups with love. Christ is the way to love. Christ offers the truth to turn us from hate toward the way of love. Christ is the life that transforms us and propels us toward one another in love. And Christ will one day return to complete his work in us so that we will know the freedom from sin and find the complete harmony with God and one another we were created for. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. It's Christ, right? B. Second one. The all-good, all-wise, all-powerful Father makes it clear that the underlying cause of hostility between people and people groups is rooted in their hostility toward Him. Say it again. The, The hostility between people and people groups is rooted in their hostility of Him. It's a symptom of their rebellion against God as their creator and His design for them. To go at the symptom... Human hostility toward each other without going at the cause, hostility toward God will never bring peace. 
groups or peoples who offer prescriptions for peace without Christ may succeed in stopping open hostility between people or groups. But they'll have to do it by oppression, hopefully by persuasion or by reward, right? Care to the stick. But they cannot create the kind of real, life-giving, mutually self-sacrificing, rich commitment of one person to another that happens when Christ transforms the heart. And almost always their prescription will only cause more human suffering as the followers are encouraged to look to them instead of God and are promised something that these groups can never deliver on. Three, to encourage divisions in the body of Christ is to sin. Okay, I'm not, these are my harshest words all morning, I'm going to say. I want to be clear. To cause divisions, encourage divisions in the body of Christ is sin, whether that is to be passively caused by passively disengaging or by actively driving wedges between people or groups within the body of Christ. To divide believers is to work expressly against what God has done in Christ and what His Spirit is sustaining, what His Spirit wants to deepen, what His Spirit wants to enrich as those united Christ. So three things under here. Each believer is called to move toward each other with the resources they have in Christ, anticipating God's blessings. There are no mere consumers who benefit from the labors of brothers and sisters to know each other, to invest in each other, to support each other, to correct each other, to rescue each other, and so serve alongside of each other for their mutual benefit and for the glory of God. This is not an organization where you hope that there's a group of people, like the old, uh, old saw, the 20% are going to work really hard so you can come and enjoy their labors not only to, to put a, a program out or resources out or to put programs for kids or whatever, this is a place where you come to be the people of God, right? not to use the resources of the people of God. The people of God don't care if you use their resources because they want to love on you, but they know that something's dysfunctional in you if you come in here and think that I'm just here to consume. Everyone is a producer who comes to love their brothers and sisters to Christ as Christ, the question each believer asks themselves is, am I trusting Christ and so giving what Christ has given me for the blessing of my brothers and sisters? How is Christ coming off by the way I'm treating my brothers and sisters? Christ is the measure that we measure our lives against. Secondly, under here, no believer can divide the body of Christ by asking for allegiance to any other person or group as a condition for accepting another brother. Let me say it again. No believer can divide the body of Christ by asking for allegiance to any other person or group as a condition for accepting another believer. Every secular organization, every political party, every, every advocacy group, every nonprofit, every charity will never perfectly align with God's expectations for his people's character and their mission. Believers will only and always be able to align themselves with these organizations, if at all, with qualifications. Third, no believer can divide the body of Christ by calling for other believers to treat what they see as a wise path to take in this moment as if it were God's command. Matters of wisdom... Right? There is no prescription right now where you can turn to Matthew chapter 4 and say, okay, here's what's going to happen in America in 2020, and these things are going to, here's exactly what you should do. And people who step up and say, this is exactly what we need to do right now, and this is exactly, they don't know. And the fact that some people don't have humility about their uh, you know, prognostications, about exactly what's going on and how we need to approach it, that in and of itself is a problem. Matters of wisdom are open to discussion and disagreement. Each should be convinced in their own mind, as Paul would say. Okay. Finally, my last one. In looking to maintain, deepen, or restore relationships in the body of Christ, right? to maintain them, to deepen them, or restore relationships in the body of Christ, we should look to God's direction for how we should think of ourselves and respond to each other. The Lord of the church has left his manual with his resources to appropriate. It's true so that we can encourage, guide, and correct ourselves until he returns. What we need to know now is to listen to do what he instructs us to do. And there's all kinds of passages. I'd encourage you to look at Romans 12 through 14, those chapters. Philippians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 3, and of course to continue reading here in Ephesians. And I want to conclude my message by reading Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 32. 
Anybody who thinks these are easy, anybody who thinks that these are not the prescriptions for how to deepen, enrich, and maintain relationships needs to take it up with the Father. This is what he says. Therefore, each of you must, verse 25, put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk tweet out of your social, that doesn't what it says here, come out of your tweets, come out of your Facebook, come out of all those distancing things where you speak to people as if you wouldn't speak to people when they're present in front of you. You build barriers and, 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 and send barbs and, and little quips that you think, ah, I owned that person. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit not only empowers you to be different, but he's the down payment that guarantees that the triumph of God over all the suffering and difficulties you have, that it's going to happen. So have hope. Don't give in. Don't give up. Don't abandon God's ways. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger from past offenses. From present offenses, get rid of it. Brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's his prescription. Sarah, would you come and lead us in a song? Thank you, Sarah. What an appropriate song. We trust in the Christ who has overcome Uh, the darkest things in our soul, the darkest things in the world, and ultimately one day will complete his victory and bring us into that triumph when he writes all things. Now, if you're listening and and you're in one of our care groups, I just want to pause for a moment as I conclude here and encourage you. Uh, There's a sheet that you'll find that's sent out as a kind of a discussion prompt, uh, and it's the same sheet that was last week, and I want to ask you and ask uh, the leaders here, I I would appreciate it if you would treat the last two questions on that sheet as the focus of your discussion. Uh, And uh, if you were there last week, there's still plenty of things for you to go after this week. The last two questions, what kind of challenges do we face on the personal and corporate level at EBC to be the people of God, diverse body? And see if we can list some specific things and what are some steps that we can take and try to work through one or two of them. Let me just give you one suggestion from Ephesians chapter 4. What would it look like if we actually committed to depth in our relationships with each other so that we actually spoke the truth to each other? You and I both know that when we get to a certain point in a relationship and you find out all of a sudden that this person doesn't agree with you on something and you back away to the weather, you shift around the other thing and you never dig into your differences over issues and then we leave the relationship at a very surface level and we go away never really knowing each other, never really listening to each other. Sometimes we do that because we think we prejudge people, we don't assume the best, they won't listen, right? Or it's gonna, uh, we're gonna, you know, we may, you, may lose our, uh, my, my friendship. And what I want to say right now is you don't have a friendship. You don't have a real connection with that person. It's a surface level thing that you have anywhere in the world. So what is God's prescription? Well, if you delve in, you find out you disagree, you listen. You talk with each other. You love each other. You pray through it. You forgive each other. Right? You keep pushing back toward each other. We need persistence and honesty. There are some of our black brothers and sisters who need to be honest some of our white brothers and sisters who need to be honest with each other and they need to have conversations that are true of the people of God that aren't mediated by their politics, are mediated by some other group. So God help us to be the people of God. We cannot tiptoe around the issues and look to the culture to give us cues on how to be the people of God. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We have the apostolic teaching and all the resources of God in Christ by the Spirit. In every way that people help us from outside, we do that because we recognize its congruence with the heart of Jesus. We don't look to them to be Jesus. So God help us. We love you. I love you as brothers and sisters in Christ. May God help us be his people to believe in his way, to trust in his power, 
and to live faithfully and truly in line with his expectations. They're overwhelming, and we need a big God to do that. So God bless you. Have a great day.